school committee meeting to order. Welcome everybody. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda tonight. Uh, all all good all good stuff. Uh, so uh, before we start the meeting, uh, is there anyone uh, that has public input uh, uh, that for something that isn't on the agenda tonight? None. Okay. So tonight we'll start with the uh, Reading Education Foundation. Uh, I guess this, what's this, the third or fourth annual? Uh, fifth. fifth. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to come up. so we hope all of you um, will be able to attend you can get tickets online um, we're also doing what we're adopting as our third big fundraiser which is our teacher tributes um, which is open to the parents at the school or anyone in the community that wants to send a teacher a tribute um, and those you can order online um, and that is open now and we've actually joined forces with the PTO um, so the PTOs will earn 30% of any teacher tribute that their school sells. Um, so on behalf of the board, uh, the Reading Education Foundation, I'm thrilled to say that we have approved uh, to fund grants equaling $44,214.19. Wow. Um, wow. um, and even bigger since our inception, which we were known as the Reading Technology and Education Fund beforehand, we have actually given uh, Reading Public Schools over $500,000 in our 15 years. So um, we're very excited for that. Um, we thank everybody that has been supporting us, especially these last five years. Um, and to kind of go over the grants that we've approved, um, I have our grant chair, Nancy Dieselman, here. Um, and with us, too, is our treasurer, um, Lori Foley. Um, so Nancy. Okay. Um, so as Mike said, we've awarded over $44,214 this year, and it goes across 12 grants, three at the high school level, one middle school, high school combined grant, and four each at the middle schools and the elementary schools. Um, probably the, the most interesting um, grant grants span all schools and all levels. Um, we have Makerspace and STEAM uh, grants that are basic. I know you guys have had presentations before on maker spaces, and they're basically creative learning spaces where kids can work on their own and and just be creative. Sometimes it's related to a class. Sometimes it's a before or after school um, time that they have, or sometimes they use it when they have free time in their library or their studies. And right now, these areas are set up um, in the library, and they're operating with whatever resources they have. And these grants at all the different levels are basically asking for more resources so the kids had more stuff that they can use to explore with. And for any of you who don't know, um, Stan, uh, STEAM stands for um, Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. So it's basically blending art with technology. And um, so at the high school and the middle school level, we are providing things such as um, basic hardware kits of gizmos and gidget, uh, I'm sorry, gid gadgets and gizmos. Um, basic circuitry kits, tool kits, um, idea booklets, um, fun things like Google Cardboard, which if any of you have used it, they, um, they kind of simulate um, a virtual reality. They're basically um, cardboard goggles and you use it with an app with your iPhone and it, it, it simulates um, virtual reality. It's very cool. Um, they cost like $3 each for these little cardboard things. Um, at the elementary school level, it's more robotics. Um, based and we're buying two different sets of robots. Uh, one's called Dot Dash, which is for the K to three group. And for the fifth, fourth and fifth graders, it's the MIP robotic kits. So all elementary schools will be getting these different kits. Um, at the high school level, we have a really exciting new uh, class. It's called Computing in the Arts. 
and Steve Cogger has um, designed a new class that's going to be offered for next year. And basically what it is, is it's a STEM class for non-technical kids. It's a class for kids who are into art and music and want to learn how to apply technology to their artwork. And it's a fascinating, fascinating class where these kids are going <coughs> to learn basic programming and design, and they're going to be able to create their artifacts that will re, um, respond to human input. So you have an art installation or, or you have a, a, a keyboard with programmable music and it'll respond to a touch or to a, uh, lights going off and on. So it's, it's a very, um, very, very interesting approach and it's so relevant these days because art is, um, technology is so integrated in the arts as it is out in, in the world with website design and there's just so much already th there and now the kids can have a taste of it in high school, which is wonderful. Um, so basically we're providing the hardware and the software for this class um, to bring it to the next level. Um, when he first offered the class, he knew that he had enough interest, hopefully, to fill up one class. And he emailed me last week, and he was so thrilled. They had over 52 students sign up for this new class next year. They're going to have two full sessions of this class with kids on the waiting list. Yeah. So it shows that, that the kids are really interested in this type of um, um, integration of technology and, and art. And we're happy <coughs> to be able to provide some material for it. And the last thing I'd like to highlight um, is a Killam grant, and it's a um, three-day residency program uh, where they're going to create a living painting on the field that will incorporate every student and every administrator in the school and they will the, the only way you can really view the, the painting is from above and they're going to be using a bucket truck and taking a picture so if you can picture the whole school population on the field and even though the residency program is three days the school is going to be working on this for a couple of months preparing for it. They pick the topic that they want the picture to be. They, de <coughs> um, they develop class, uh, class lessons around this topic. They collect um, recyclables and materials that they want to incorporate in their artwork. Mm -hmm. And then the artist comes in and works with them and they actually grid it out on the field behind the school. And um, different grades wear different colored t-shirts depending on what their art is going to look like and in the end they actually have a bucket truck come in and take a picture from above of what this artwork looks like and what's so interesting about it is that it really gives the children a chance to develop kind of a big picture approach to creative problem solving and to kind of deepen perception so it's a very interesting program we think that um, the, the school's going to get a lot out of it and we may be seeing more of it if it's a if it's a big success um, there are many other grants on the list. I think you probably have a list of them in there. And if you have any questions on any of the others, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, I always really appreciate the, you know, the thoughtful and thorough process you go uh, to award the grant. Can, can you share how many uh, actual applications you had? Or? This year we had 13, but it varies widely. Um, some years we've had three times the number that we, that we end up awarding. This year we were able to award almost all of them. Um, it, it varies a lot uh, every year to year how many we get. <coughs> yes. So I just want to, on the end of the whole committee, say thank you. I was previously on the board and um, it's an enormous, enormous amount of work um, and volunteer time, time out of your job during the day. And um, I know I can see when uh, Nancy talks it's so exciting to hear the grant presentations and it's so energizing to really see the great things that teachers are doing and want to do in the district so I really just want to thank it, all of the board members for their commitment you guys have been on the board for at least five years pretty much um, and I just want to as we listen to this I want to just highlight the event on Saturday is really important for the community to support um, it's a way that we can very importantly say yes to our schools because REF can't um, provide $44,000 a year and uh, over $500,000 um, without our support. And it's a really great, fun event mm -hmm. as a past uh, attendee. Um, I know people have been emailing me. I'm like, yes, I'm coming. I was on vacation. Uh, so I'm really excited about it. Just a plug for that. If your plans don't include Saturday, we also have a two-week-long online auction going on. It's actually live now, and it ends on May 6th. So if you find that you can't attend the event, although I hope everybody can because it's a fun <coughs> event, and, um, but if you can't and you still want to uh, support our efforts, we have 100
hundred over a hundred items online. Right. And, and they're really good. There's great items in the auction, so I'll make a shameless plug. I donated a day <laughs> sale on a classic y'all, and uh, <coughs> and it's actually good indefinitely, although we do it every year. Sometimes we can't get people in the water. They're good forever, as long as we put our boat in the water. So I encourage people to go partake, and uh, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that day on the y'all is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, I've done it too. It's a <laughs> great day. <laughs> it's not to be missed. Yep, yep. Um, last night, our selectmen and our chair put in a plug and a thank you for our volunteers. And I just wanted to reiterate partially what um, Mrs. Webb said. But without you guys and without our other volunteers, our PTOs and our teachers going above and beyond, our schools would not be what they are. And so I, I couldn't let it go by without saying that myself. Um, thank you so much to you. Thank you to everyone that's gone out of their way to donate and participate, and to the teachers for taking the time to think beyond the everyday classes, mm -hmm. to imagine what education, what meaningful education can be. These projects are things that our kids and our families are gonna remember, and my <coughs> kids have. Mm -hmm remembered forever so I just I wanted to reiterate that thank you because without you and the volunteers we couldn't be what we are thank you thank you thank you thanks again thank you I'm looking for the big where's the big check <laughs> <laughs> for the photo ops <laughs> we presented it um, to John Dari last week we were going to come to the meeting on the right. No, yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm joking. We wanted to make sure that you guys had the money. Yeah. <laughs> it was in the paper. Huh? I saw the picture yeah, in the yeah. paper, yes, yes. in the Chronicle. We wanted to get in the paper. We kind of felt like bringing it now a little after that, but yeah. it was still $44,000. Thank wanted you. wanted to get it in the good. paper for pre-celebration. Yeah. You have a... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, move to accept the donation in the amount of... $43,363.66 from the Reading Education Foundation. Is there a second? A second. Second. All those I think one more round of applause. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for your patience, the uh, Coolidge Science team. It was always a fun night. So yes, I'm, I'm going to introduce the uh, first spokesperson, um, Sarah Murphy. Sarah is going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of the team, but also the whole team is going to, I'm sure, talk a little bit. I see <laughs> devices. I see other things. Um, so I'm sure they're going to talk about some of the things that they're doing. Um, they're before you today because, as you know, they um, uh, won the state championship, Massachusetts State Science Olympiad Championship. Um, for the 21st time out of 22? 23rd. 22nd out of 23rd, 23rd out of 24th. No, I don't know, I've lost no track. Um, and they get to now go to the University of Wisconsin. Oh, again? Uh, to compete. In Madison? The Nationals. It's a different one. Oh. Menominee. Oh, nice. And that will be in a couple of weeks. So, Sarah Murphy, you're on. Um, so, I'm here to talk about the history of the team which was founded by John Dory and Mr. John McCarthy 24 years ago in 1992. Um, can, we, can we make sure that she get mic'd? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. We want to make sure people at home can hear you. Okay. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Pull it up and click on the So today I'm here again to speak on behalf of the Cooler Science team. Um, we were founded again by Mr. John Dory and Mr. John McCarthy 24 years ago in 1992. We have won the state championship 23 out of 24 times, <coughs> which is, I don't know, but it is a great accomplishment. Um, uh, we um, were planning our trip again to Menominee, Wisconsin, and well, I don't really know how to phrase it other than um, every time that we've gone on this trip, it has been an adventure. So, again, going so many times has 
led to many great different experiences for so many children who have now grown again. Um, so I think just being able to go on this trip in May would be another great experiences experience <laughs> because of the two that I've had prior to this one have been just absolutely amazing. So it has really shaped so many different people in the past 24 years to be inspired to go into the STEM fields and really has changed a lot of people over the course of 24 years. So if we could have that opportunity again to be encouraged to learn <coughs> and to apply our knowledge to other fields, that would be wonderful. So um, in this science team program, there are three different types of events. There are the building events, the content events, and the process events. And I will give you an example of each. So an example of a building event is an event that I was actually on, bottle rockets, in which, Kevin, hold it up, please. You, you build a bottle rocket. Um, <laughs> and what you, but um, the goal is to launch it into the air with our launcher and um, make it have the most amount of time in the air without having any deployable um, mechanisms like a parachute or something. But there's a catch this year. We had to also have an egg inside the rocket uh -huh. and if the egg cracked then no deal. <laughs> no deal. Whoa. <laughs> it, was, it, it proved a great challenge and we had to find a whole bunch of new resources um, to, to make this possible. An example of a process event is um, crime busters. In the event, you are given a crime, and you have to dis and you have to use the tools given to um, to study the different blood samples and fibers to find out who the culprit was. And then afterward, you have to write an analysis. Um, and an example of a content event is another event I was on, Reach for the Stars, in which you s in which you study constellations, the stars inside those constellations, how uh, stellar classification and evolution, and then how to relate to stars using the electromagnetic spectrum. So I'm going to talk about the amount of time that goes into these events that uh, Jason has given examples of. So our practice schedule allows for 16 and a half hours of practice a week. And these are volunteered hours by everyone on the science team. There are required blocks, but the rest are all because we want to be on the science team. And these 16 and a half hours are what makes oh, state winning bottle rockets and this hovercraft that we will be competing at the nationals with if we can. And then this is such a great time during the week to connect with everyone and work on a shared goal and everything. So for the 16 and a half hours, states goes by like that. You, do, you always seem like you don't have enough time. And so you have to learn a lot of time management. And this time management is really key So to building, again, these state-winning bottle rockets. Because <laughs> it's, it's a great thing to be able to compete at states and win and know that you won because you put in all of this time and effort. 
So that's all I want to say. Uh, so I'm Pete Coster, and I'm going to be talking about uh, states. So states this year was at Assumption, Assumption College in Worcester on March 5th. Uh, we had one day of competing against 28 other middle schools from all around Massachusetts. So even though all of our events were worked on separately, this was a team effort. Every event counted the same. Uh, we helped each other, cheered on for each other, were there for each other, uh, and so this really felt like a team. Uh, so part of the ways we could support each other were uh, seeing the building events. So uh, we could cheer on them, our teammates. Uh, and since I was on a building event and I experienced this, I uh, it's fun knowing that you have a bunch of teammates, some parents and some coaches behind you cheering you on when you're competing. Uh, so while I was competing, I was focused, just wanted to do good, I guess. Uh, but then in my free time, I was laid back, having loads of fun, uh, playing with people that I had spent countless hours working with. So it was fun to lay back with them. I also got to meet uh, kids from all around Massachusetts and play with them, play frisbee, soccer, football. So that was really fun. Um, so jumping to the award ceremony at the end of the day. Uh, so it was fun and exciting and exhilarating to see how many times Coolidge got called up to get a medal or a ribbon. I, I was so excited. I cheered on my teammates. Uh, and it was fun to know that ha receiving a medal or ribbon because you deserved it. You spent countless hours working on it. And so finally, when Coolidge got called up because we won first place, uh, I feel really accomplished, really joyous, uh, and I just knew that we had accomplished <coughs> it. And so that's all I have to say. I'm Catherine Growney, I'm in seventh grade. Um, after we win the states, we go to nationals, which we will be competing in this year. It will be held at the University of Wisconsin-Stout in Menominee, Wisconsin. At nationals, we compete against 60 other teams from across the country that have been competing, that have been working all year um, with the same events, and we compete against them. And it also provides us with an opportunity to meet them and interact with them and um, interact with students from across the country that share interest, to share their interest of science with us. And, and um, it also gives us an opportunity to stay in a college dorm on a campus in a state we most likely have never visited before. And it gets us thinking about our college future. Oh. <laughs> That's it. start? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to talk about an experience we had during this science team program. <coughs> okay. So these these take place in um, our favorite event, the event that we work together on, Bottle Rockets. Wait, what? Favorite? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kevin. Yeah, it's our favorite. It's our favorite. Come on. Let's talk um, so on bottle rockets, um, it required a lot of engineering skills, and that's really what it took to build the best rocket. You needed, you need to have a lot uh, of knowledge uh, on the topic of aerospace engineering, and you need to know how to get this rocket to have as as low drag going up and as much drag going back down 
to get as high as you can and uh, to come down slowly to get the best possible time. And we spent so much time uh, working on uh, the rockets that we built. That's an we built more than just <laughs> <laughs> well, the regulars built more than just this. We have like we built like ten over the course of the year, but uh, they each had uh, their own diversity. Well, their own aspect of diversity. Um, so, uh, some right. were made out of foam. Yeah. Some had. Uh, this nose cone design, which we found to be very successful, and uh, some had crazy looking fins. <laughs> um, yeah, you can take it. And um, another thing that this event taught us was how to use and test and learn about different materials. Because you see, we don't just suddenly know all these materials that we have to use. Um, we it it, it takes yeah, exactly. It takes a lot of time to, you know, figure out what we need to use. For example, we had mylar when we first started, which is the thing we build the nose cone out of. But um, you see that pink foam towards the end? That's normally where we hold the egg. It goes through the door. Through the polystyrene. Yep. And that is one of the many materials that we had to research. Flo uh, floor foam. It is... Through the polystyrene. Or that. <laughs> Jeez, scientific names. Um, <laughs> basically, the, the point of it was that it was really light, which is really good if you want your rocket to go high. It also reduces drag on the way up. Um, and it can also take a pretty big blow, which was really helpful for, as I described earlier, um, egg impact. It has to have a lot of endurance in that, order to survive yeah. uh, the velocities that it travels at. That's why we had a bubble wrap. Yeah. <laughs> but Useful. Yeah. How many G-forces at launch, Jason? Uh, ten. Ten, ten Gs. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have... Yes, there's one no. additional thing. So, this is the hovercraft that we, that I personally, along with my partner, who is not here today, have built, along with the help of coaches, including Mr. Beckley, and we couldn't have done it without them. So, thank you. So and before he starts that up, the, the rear motor, we haven't got a cage yet for, so it's disconnected. So, we just have the motor that lifts the skirt and lifts it up and causes the vehicle to hover. So, you get to see a hover demonstration, but not a motion demonstration. Yep. It is it is moderately so loud because it's event with this. right. So this event is a trial event that happens when we when we won states this year. There are events added to the national competition that we didn't have time to prepare for before states, and this is one of them. And it's you <coughs> build the hovercraft, and you also study high school level physics like kinematics, kinetic kinetic energy, Newton's laws of motion, and air cushioned vehicles and applications in the real world, like military, huge hovercraft, larger than this room, and ones like this. So, I think, ready to wire it. So, the battery's here, and this is the motor that lifts it, and our prop. Yeah, the mic, thank you. <laughs> job guys uh, it's it's clear uh, to me that uh, you know there's a passion uh, for science here but the thing that, that that really sticks with me is with what you guys just did is I'm so proud of the way you presented uh, you're well spoken you're clearly paying attention to things other than science I mean you got great leadership and and uh, communication I mean that's all important 
You're a lot more than scientists. We should be proud. Yes. I have a question. So what's the um what are the great swap swap items yet? Any good that swap items? My dad got Josh some bags from Novartis. From where? Uh, from Novartis. All right. What are, what are you wearing on your heads? Oh, oh we yeah. get well hats. Your <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. That's the swap is one of the events that is great for collaboration because all the members of all the teams get to meet each other in usually a humongous field house and they each team brings a goodie bag full of multiple numbers of a variety of items and they get to all swap them and it's one of the um, funnest parts I think of nationals. The team from Maine brought moxie, cans of moxie. Mm -hmm. So I, I, in terms of the college, my um, three of my four sons are science team grads and I'm on a past event coach. And um, I, have, I now have two nephews at University of Madison, Wisconsin, because Parker Webb went to a competition at U Madison, Wisconsin. And at the time, his older brothers were graduating, and we dragged them along with us to see U Madison. And so all three of those boys got into U Madison, which is a fabulous engineering school. The sort of the strange thing is neither, none of them ended up actually going there, but both of my nephews uh, ended up there because of our Coolidge Science Team connection to U Madison. So these experiences that you guys have on the college campuses are so valuable and it was really, it's really great to hear that, you know, you guys even now recognize that, that value and really that, that privilege. Um, it's just, you know, obviously you did a fabulous job winning states and the big prize is, you know, getting to go to nationals and have that experience. Um, I was also really, I think the thing that you, you talked about, about getting that medal, but knowing that you had worked so hard. And that's, I think uh, Kathy Giles has a, uh, the Killam has a grit and persistence. And the way to build confidence <coughs> is by having grit and being persistent. And, y you know, it's not false medals it's true earned experiential medals and that's and recognition and i know you experienced it and you will experience it the the sort of there's also some agony of defeats sometimes and w everyone here who's been involved in the team knows that but as a result then of the persistence and the grit and the stick to itiveness you build confidence that you take with you every step of the rest of your life and so I'm so excited to hear the team and thanks to all the parents and volunteers and pa volunteers and coaches who don't have kids on the team anymore <laughs> stick with it sort of forever. <coughs> so um, I hope you guys have an absolutely amazing trip to Wisconsin. Thank you for saying again some of what I wanted to say. I was scribbling down all the amazing things that that contribute to what you've learned and mostly it's your energy and your dedication your commitment it's so impressive and I know it's not just impressive to me because I'm looking around the room at the glowing faces everyone is so proud of you and of what you've done and um, Mrs. Webb talked about the grit and the persistence and another word that's thrown around is the resilience I heard from you that there were lots of mistakes that you had to deal with while you were spending those 16 and a half hours a week, right? Yes. Um, learning. And so one of the goals of the schools is to empower and enable children to make mistakes and learn from them and not be defeated from them by them. And you got awards for just that, for sticking with it, for being creative, for leaving one material to try a different material. And I just think there's so much kudos because so often making mistakes in an environment can derail kids and they get afraid to try something completely different or some completely new and you obviously have done that and succeeded with it. And I just so much kudos to you. I also have, and, and also I wanted to remark on the culture of support that I saw. Through those mistakes, it seems to me that people were obviously not judging you for the mistakes, but supporting you through them. 
to go to a different place or another place. And, and so kudos to your coaches and your um, volunteers. And I had a question. So this is an amazing bottle rocket that I have never seen anything like. The, the hovercraft, I, that's beyond even my imagination, amazing. I'm wondering what different ones look like. Do they all look end up looking the same, or do they look different? Well, so um, they come out completely different. Um, this is one of the ones on. that we have. That's this is one of the ones we brought to states, and that's it's sort of that's sort of the average size. But some of them are shorter, and some of them are a lot taller. Like we have one that's seven feet long, that we didn't bring anywhere <laughs> because it didn't fit in the car. But um, <laughs> logistics. <laughs> but so. <coughs> Earlier in the year, we tried to use that pink foam and use a big sheet of it, and we tried to roll it and make that the cone, but it didn't stand up to the 10 G force of launch. <laughs> so the mylar that we use is the tried and true material for the nose cone. And recently, we've been trying a new concept for the fins that we hope will give us more time on the way down, which is so that we have a big long piece of pink foam that stretches all the way up the nose cone that um, tapers off slowly so and the nose cone is slightly longer um, I would also like to mention that this nose cone not not only is it like all that what you said but um it's it's a big process of trial and error error because originally we we just had nose cones that were just straight up like this, and um, you know, a lot of different yeah a lot of different yeah. nose cones. But this one so far I believe has been the best because um, what we did was we rolled the mylar as you see here, and it also allows more aerodynamic ability, and yeah, um, <laughs> as well as the tape that holds it together. Um, First thing, it doesn't have any wrinkles, so it is, again, stream, uh, very, aerody very aerodynamic, and it also holds it together very well. And what Jason is talking about when he says that it used to be straight up, we used to use the plastic light bulb tubes without light bulbs in them. Um, <laughs> and we would just tape that to the nozzle of a, um, of a bottle, and but we realized that that was not as aerodynamic as it could be, so we went to this. As for hovercrafts, this one is by far the smallest that I've seen, and um, most others are much lighter than this, if they're this size, and they'd be made out of foam, so that you could just put a motor on it and the propeller, and it would just lift up, but the event rules say that you get more points the closer you are to four pounds without going over. So that's why this is so, wo it's wooden, it has hefty motors, so we want more points. And larger, the, like huge scale hovercrafts have a much larger skirt than this to have an air cushion to mm -hmm. weigh itself on, whereas this one can just lift itself pretty much. And what happened when we tried the larger skirt? Yeah, so when we tried the larger skirt, one that's not, you wouldn't imagine it would be too large, but it is. And it would cause this to tilt over to one side dramatically. So we had to cut the skirt down. And so the, the larger ones have huge, huge skirts that are made out of like inch thick rubber that do the same thing, but better for that size. So that's the variation for hovercraft. Thank you. I just had a quick question. That was really a fantastic presentation. So thank you for spending this time with us. I you're clearly passionate, all of you, about science and engineering and technology. Um, can you pinpoint anything that adults in your life, parents, teachers, coaches, have done to inspire that? Oh, um, Sarah. Well. Since before Science Olympiad, I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do later on in life as far as really even a general topic. Um, I've had coaches and events that have made me want to go into chemistry. So 
um, at least I know I've already chose the high school courses I want to take and I've already been looking at certain colleges that I would like to apply to because I know for a fact that I that is exactly what I want to, to do since I've joined Science Olympia. So um, there have been coaches and events that have really helped me to understand the field and wanted me, well, made me want to pursue it for really like helping me know what I want to do for the rest of my life. So it's so really it's the exposure to a lot of different areas of science and then you found the one that yes. just really resonated. Interesting. Um, I would also like to add something. Uh, I, when, when I entered Coolidge Middle School, I'm like, you know, I like science. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Well, I wasn't the best at it, but I liked it. Um, but when I joined the science team a year later, it really brought me literally into the subject. I, start, I started be, uh, beginning to work at a much larger rate than I ever worked before, but it was like really fun. I, I started working on all new branches of science, like bottle rockets, uh, reach for the stars, and a whole bunch of other stuff, and with help from my coaches. Um, Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, astronomy. Um, so, but with help from my coaches, um, I, 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 I hit a few roadblocks here and there and there and everywhere. Um, <coughs> but with, again, with help from my coaches, I was able to get past those roadblocks because I, I never knew being a scientist could be so hard. You know, always having to focus on the task at hand, always. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't really. I, I'm just, I'm just bad at work and stuff. <laughs> and be so much Good fun at, at the same time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Doing great. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just had a quick question. I just wanted to ask, um, what do you use to launch it? That Big Ten G. We have a launcher. <laughs> <laughs> we so uh, <laughs> the launcher that we have is. A tripod of PVC and yeah, it has a yeah. nozzle on it. Um, that's that attached to a bicycle that, pump. Yeah, that's it's attached to a bicycle pump. It pumps air into it, which uh, goes with the water. And uh, so this is no. really just propelled by water and air pressure. And oh, we're given, uh, we're not given any, not told the amount. But yeah, it's at between 45 and 60 psi. At the com they just they tell us that on the day of the competition. Yeah. Can you pass the oh, thank you. Pass that around. Great. Thank you. Thanks again, thank guys. You. hoverboard for no apparent reason, but he just decided he wanted to try to make a hoverboard. Good for him. <laughs> he was using it in the driveway, him and his friend. <laughs> the hovercraft is new. They're, they're piloting it for next year. I think we're going to see it. So I think the, the science team has definitely not come out of them. It's always oh. there. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. You won't need luck. You've got all the skill and know how. They do a consent set? agenda now, so you're all set. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask just one question off the record? Have you guys been to Bodeborg in Malden? The questing place? You should go as a team. You guys would crush it. Look it up. It's, it's the only North American post. It's in, it's in
Houston Mall that is called Photo Board. And it's 21 different rooms and some physical challenges, some mental challenges. As a team, you would love it. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for all your support. agenda that anyone would like to take off. Mr. Chair, move to approve the consent agenda as presented. There is second. Second. Those in favor? Five zero. Uh, why don't we uh, do reports and then uh, mm -hmm. Carl, do you have a yep. So this Saturday at 7 p.m. in the auditorium, the Improvisaurus is having a charity show. Um, it costs $5, and all the money will go to the David K. Johnson Foundation, which is a foundation that helps to find a cure for Alzheimer's and helps to support families affected by Alzheimer's. Um, also, at Friday and before that, Friday at 7 p.m., the Band Chorus and Drama Club are hosting a mini golf fundraiser on Main Street of the high school, so if anyone wants to attend those. Um, for our senior school year is winding down, there's less than 20 days left, and next week AP exams will be starting. So, yeah, that's, wow. pr that's pretty much what's going on at the high school right now. Great, thanks Carl. Uh, I just, before we, uh, I just wanted to comment on last night. Uh, you know, as I've always said uh, to everybody, uh, you know, this position is the first among equals, uh, and that's all it is. And uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to everybody before I talked last night, but that kind of came together late. And uh, I did was I sh I did not ask people for input, so I just didn't want people to think that I just got up there and uh, I tried to we, we tried to capture what we thought everyone would would want to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, also to, to last night, uh, one of the things that when at the end when when uh, Mr. Halsey was presenting uh, about the community meetings uh, and you know I, I think this is how they they plan it but I want to make sure I, they were referred to as listening meetings and you know I take the approach that and I think everyone here does is that you know the community expects leadership from us so I'm not uh, although I want to hear what people have to say uh, they want to hear from us too and and I you know I don't I don't want those to be portrayed as uh, residents coming with their laundry list of, of what they want to be part of a I think we need to to be presenting at that as well and that mm -hmm. that's what we're elected for that's what we uh, need to show that <laughs> and I think the Board of Selectmen feels the same way I just don't know whether it came across that way last night but Agreed. more to come on that Any, did you ever no reports no um, I was fortunate to go to the April 11th CPAC meeting, which was jam-packed. It's a very energetic group of people that were there. It was awesome to be a part of. They discussed um, the organization for elections for next year. They're also 
talking about having speakers at their meetings and how they might be able to raise funds for those. They're all putting their heads together. Um, they're looking forward to Mrs. Wilson um, presenting on the new names for the programs. That's in an upcoming meeting. I, in June. June 7th, yeah. maybe? 6th. 6th, yeah. sorry, June 6th. Um, and the group got very excited about Samantha Gibbs' um, Buddy Bench project that she's doing for her Silver Girl Scout Silver Award. Um, so that was really exciting to see. There was a lot of expression of support for Samantha's project because um, ours is a district that tries to include everyone, especially with our Understanding Disabilities program, sensitizing people to the needs of those with differing abilities. And this buddy bench is one more tool to help integrate the playground to get everybody out, up playing. So um, that was really exciting. And um, speaking of UD, that is who presented at this meeting. So they talked about their curriculum updates that they've been enabled to do because of the Cummins Foundation grant. They talked about speakers that they've brought to the schools. Um, including Shauna Stilling and Ned Halliwell, and they even had clips so people could see um, snippets from the presentations about the programs that they've done, like the Teal Pumpkins, which I knew nothing about, which signify that you are an allergy, allergen-free home on Halloween, so that if you have a child with allergies and you see a teal pumpkin at the door, you will know that that is a safe place for your child to trick-or-treat, which I thought was really sensitive and ingenious. They did a light at blue night at the steeple. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, their classroom work where they're touching every one of our elementary school kids with sensitivity, knowledge, and understanding. So it was really um, very exciting <coughs> to be a part of that meeting. I have one more. Um, and also I was asked to mention that the police station is actually going to be able to have a rad class again um, actually two classes this spring the first one starts on Monday May 9th and the second one starts on Tuesday June 7th and if I can put a personal plug in for this I found my voice when I went through this training I thought I couldn't yell but I learned how so it was it was just very worthwhile not only the physical defense part of it but also the prepar preparedness, knowing how to avoid situations and how to be prepared for them. So I highly recommend finding out more about this. You can call the police station to find out more. I lied. There's one more. And also <coughs> the RACASA course, the mental health first aid for youth starts on Wednesday, um, May 4th. Yes, Wednesday, May 4th from 6 to 8, and then for three consecutive Wednesdays. I attended the adult one. It was on a Saturday. It was awesome, very informative, and unfortunately, I got to use it within a week. Um, and I was really glad because while I was on the phone with my um, dear one, I would, not one of my kids, um, I was able to go and take out the resources that we had been handed and connect her with a text helpline that she can contact 24 hours a day. Um, and she actually isn't in as supportive a school as we have here um, and called me from there. So um, I'm very thankful for this and I really recommend anybody. And I know they're trying to get more dates, but there's definitely one starting on May 4th. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Robinson. I just wanted to, I did take the youth mental health first aid at the last session and it was excellent. So I highly recommend it. And uh, I, I, I know Erica was trying to get some information out to the, to the papers and get feedback from people. I, I feel remiss I didn't get to give her feedback, but it was outstanding. She does a great job and really um, pulls the class together in a way that you learn from each other as well as from her and the content. So I highly recommend that. Um, I also w was, I'm also the representative on the Belayed Start Committee, and we did have our first meeting, and maybe, I don't know if um, Mr. Martin is going to talk about that at all, or, um, so I, the meeting was really very well attended, there were, um, 
I mean, the, the range of people that were laid out, teachers and um, uh, union president and um, uh, Mrs. Williams and Mr. Martin co-chaired it, presented a lot of a lot of data. There was a lot of just sort of open dialogue. Um, and I think, uh, I'm not sure, I know there was a little bit, because of town meeting, it was a little hard to schedule the next meeting. Uh, but I know that both, I think people gave feedback. You guys were looking for some more data. So I'm sure our next meeting will um, really be able to take a look at some data. And I think the, um, well, what was certainly was made clear, though, was that, you know, this is a direction that we're moving in and we need to really um, figure out how we might do that and take into account the research, um, the, the, the specifics of our district, um, take into account, you know, what other data is out there uh, and, and figure out how to do that. Um, from my my perspective, though, one of the mo I mean, one of the things that we we do have to do is we have to not increase our transportation costs. So, as a school committee member representative to that <coughs> forum, um, I'm definitely going to be a little bit of the watchdog on that one. I'm sure Craig is also, but um, you know, I think we have to really look at you know how we can do that and meet the needs of all the constituents involved. So there was a lot of, it was really good dialogue though. And also I participated in the RACASA, is that the SAMHSA grant, the audit? Which grant was that? Um, that was federal. the, yeah, it was the SAMHSA grant, yeah. So the federal, not agent, but the federal. Actually, okay. John and I were there too. Oh, okay, so he, when he came here, so I participated with RACASA at the police station uh, and then he came here also. Right. So. That was, um, I think it was good to be able to provide our input. I don't know that we have any feedback. I think in general though, he, in the dialogue that I was in, he was really impressed with, I think, what we've done and sort of the collaboration and the leadership that our uh, coalition takes. And then lastly, I just wanted to thank um, Mr. Robinson for his work last night. And I've, I don't know how many years we've been on this board <coughs> off or on together, but I, um, really, I feel like it's an honor to serve with you. I think you are an unbelievable professional. I think you have a way of pulling people and pulling information together and being just very focused on what the important nuggets of information are. So I'm really happy to have you and, and Jean as our, um, as our leaders among equals as we go through this really uh, challenging period over the next <coughs> few months and really try to determine if the community is going to move us forward, move the community forward. Uh, so I, I just really want to thank you, Chuck. I think you're an excellent member and leader. <coughs> um, on that, just thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. That, can we get some talking points on the uh, the late start. This, there's a lot of chatter and question. Not it's all pot. It's not negative, but people are asking questions. About, and I don't. I mean, I know we're. I know we have a committee set up. But is there anything that's kind of parameters that we're looking at that if someone asks, we can say that can. You know what I'm trying. We have the research and uh, just that. We can make sure too. I mean, we we um, set minutes out to all the committee. We'll make sure that we post those, and make sure it's made known where those are available online. I mean, the initial meeting, as Ms. Webb said, was more of an introductory orientation. There was really good dialogue. I agree. A lot of it was sort of a brainstorming mm -hmm. session from different people's perspectives and point of views about all the various issues and questions that we probably need to explore yeah. as we move forward. We also kind of shared a pretty large amount of reading materials. I mean, there's been a lot of different studies and articles um, since I've even emailed people a couple more. I mean, there's, I think one of the apps that I use to search journals and things knows that this is a topic that I'm looking at. And so there, there literally are articles every single week um, across the country about school districts and um, looking at this, this issue. Um, one of the most recently that I just sent the group was actually appeared in Ed Week, the National Education Journal, but written by um, 
the assistant superintendent in Burlington urging leaders across the country to not be so tardy in making this decision <laughs> and so proud to be working in this area of the country where districts are coming together to say we really need to look at this seriously and be committed to doing what's right by kids. So, um, you know, if people have asked, well, is it a foregone conclusion that we're doing this? I mean, we sort of framed it that, you know, the research is pretty clear, but there are a lot of obstacles and things that need to be explored. Um, so we don't know exactly what the answer is, but certainly it's being looked at through the lens of what seems to be right for kids. Well, I think that yeah. the, the, you know, the thing I hear, maybe it's just because more of the people I tend to be around, especially as we get outside, people ask about how is this affecting, uh, going to affect extracurricular at youth programs that now have to wait to get onto the fields or whatever. And I know there's a much broader discussion that people need to know about that it's not just about that. <laughs> it's about the, uh, the reason yeah. why we're doing and it. That issue. And that is Came that up. was very um, prominent part of the yeah. discussion, yeah. actually. The recre one of the, rec the recreation administrator is going to be part of the group. I don't think she was able to make the first meeting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Tom is part he of was it. there. Yeah. So, and um, our Metco director is part of the group, and I think he was, um, you know, that that's really important perspectives, and um, and there were some uh, students. We had three students. Yeah, the students were, three were great. Students. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and students bringing up a, something I know I hadn't really thought of, but um, I was thinking a lot about our our own extracurriculars and how do we manage that. And he was bringing up the, the issue that, well, if you participate in something that's a community program, you know, outside the schools, um, you know, how, how will that impact those community programs? And I think that's why it's important that this is a dialogue that's not just our district, that it's more broad, because, you know, whether it's a an art or science or uh, activity or a driver's ed even, all those all those types of programs are scheduled around, you know, when are the high school kids available for those things. So, you know, I think that was a good point to bring up a concern, but there was a lot of discussion and I think we need more data and in terms of, you know, how to communicate with the public, that was I think one of the goals that uh, Lena and Craig um, said, you know, part of it is we want to make sure that people know the dialogue is there and that they hear the dialogue and what's being done. So I think that's that's an important thing. How do we get that out? We post these minutes because, um, uh, you know, I, I think that was one of the issues that came up was one community, it, um, you know, where there was sort of a lot of backlash. It wasn't so much about what the decision was as as the fact that people felt like they weren't sort of informed and involved along the way. So we have to figure out how we don't have, we go beyond the 25 people on the committee and make sure that, that you know, people Yeah, I mean, know. I suspect this will have a lot of discussion on both, I mean, it's, as you said, it's not <coughs> a foregone conclusion. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, many, many topics were raised from schedules to other demands to traffic patterns and the importance of the sort of um, you know, various start times at different levels and in an area like this how that works if we all start at the same time how that would be even more nightmare so all sorts of topics were brought up for exploration right the SRO is on the I just had something Linda said uh, or reported on is we haven't heard from uh, this committee hasn't heard from UD in a while. We should probably get them. I'd like to get hear what they're up to. I, uh, I didn't know about the pumpkin. Thing. Mm -hmm. That's they do good work. And I just have a brief update. I'm going to pass around a letter that I <coughs> sent out um, on May 9th. I'm going to do a more in-depth report out. So I just wanted to bring to your attention because there have been some questions about our reading services at the high school. Um, so this is a letter that went out to parents of students who receive reading services. So in my tenure, 
Um, we've had great difficulty hiring a reading specialist, so I just wanted to give you a perspective as to what's been happening because there have been some questions in the community about this. So the practice here in Reading is that um, for students who receive specialized reading and are on an IEP at the elementary and middle school level, that's provided by a licensed special education teacher or um, a speech and language pathologist and those individuals have training in specific reading programs. We do have reading specialists in the elementary and middle, but those individuals are not for special education purposes. That is for general education support. Um, some students on IEPs may receive services from them if they're not part of their IEP, but their purpose is not from a special ed perspective, so I wanted to um, clarify that. So at the high school, when I started in July of 2014, the position of reading specialist had been posted because previously reading services had been provided by a speech and language pathologist who was trained in reading programs. Mm -hmm. That individual left, the position was restructured. Unfortunately, we had a lot of difficulty finding an individual with that specific credential for the high school level. So last school year, we con contracted with the individuals who are on this letter and there um, to provide those services to our students about April of 2015 we actually were able to hire someone and then the position then became vacant again at the end of June we posted the position again all last summer um, and made many attempts to find a credentialed person unfortunately we were not able to find anyone so again we reached out to these individuals who were willing to come in and provide the services. The letter outlines their credentials. Um, they um, communicate directly with the special ed liaisons and the team chairs in the building. Um, and I've also worked with the staff to identify if we've missed any services. So those students who there may have been gaps or there may have been some scheduling conflicts, we have sent letters to offer compensatory services to those um, individual students. That's not every student, it's just certain students um, in analyzing schedules and sort of how service delivery happens. We had we recognized there were some inconsistencies or gaps and those families have also been notified um, about um, the opportunity to receive compensatory services. Um, so these individuals come in right now once a week. We're going to be increasing that to two times a week. So just understand the, the high school schedule is on a seven day rotating mm -hmm. schedule um, and having individuals who come in once a week. Sometimes there are some scheduling glitches. So we're doing our best to kind of work through <coughs> that to ensure that everyone's getting the appropriate services. So. So this has gone out to families, and I've asked you know to people to contact my office directly if there are any questions. So. Did this go just just high school or just high school? Because it okay. only impacts high school. Okay. As, yeah. Obviously, Carolyn, it's coming this you know spring, so we're yes. going to post again. Why are we having such a hard time finding someone for this position? I think the issue is that originally it's also been a point six position, so it hasn't been a full time position. So we're doing some restructuring and we're really focusing to mirror our model that we have at the, the middle and elementary levels that we want to utilize a licensed special educator who has training in specialized reading. So many of our special ed teachers are Wilson certified, Orton Gillingham or LIPS um, trained and that's what we really want to focus on for the high school instead of saying we need to find someone who has this reading specialist license I think it's limited our pool so we'd rather look for someone who has a special education license who's been trained in specialized reading programs mm -hmm. um, because they have the skill set to be able to do what we need them to do and um, is it going to be a full a full FTE then yes to, and we're 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 doing okay. some shifting and we think we'll meet with success for next year mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything because I have two things on the agenda coming up. So, a few quick things. Um, prior to break, as people know, we had a couple of um, staff in service days. So, on the Thursday, April 14th, students were dismissed for break at 11 o'clock. But that afternoon, um, faculty participated in <coughs> a day of collaborative learning, professional development. 
Um, that was a great day. Um, it was an opportunity for people to either make some of their own selections or their own designing of um, their collaborative learning experiences. We had a large number of staff that actually did um, come up with their own proposals, which the administrators um, approved and people were able to collaborate. We also had a large number that selected from some workshops that we had um, running that afternoon for three hours. That included Dr. George Sagai, who was actually our keynote the next day, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, who is the National Director of the Center on um, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, PBIS, connected to the MTSS work that we're doing. He worked with our district leadership team, MTSS team. Um, he actually worked with our administrators he did. in that morning, all morning, um, which was fabulous. Um, we had Craig Waterman here, who is the assessment coordinator for the DESE, that did a workshop on student um, growth and how the different ways and options for setting growth parameters for common assessments. We actually collaborated with a few <coughs> other districts on that. I think we had four representatives from four other districts um, with us there, and so we had um, staff members also from all different levels. We have Professor Mahesh Sharma that we've been doing a lot of work with um, do a K-12 math workshop on the vertical progression of the standards. This is one of the, it was um, unique in a way in that it was one of the rare opportunities we actually had um, teachers math from kindergarten to 12th grade um, talking about how those learning standards stack up um, and how important it is to be at one level, to know three levels out um, what students really need to be able to progress successfully. And so that's an example of the type of work that we're, that's ongoing in mathematics. Um, Jean Thompson Grove, which is an educator, who is an educator and consultant we've been working with, and this one was high school focused, we decided, because um, uh, we figured this would be in demand, but we had about, I think it was 35, 40 teachers from high school that were selected to be in a part of her workshop called Teaching All Kinds of Minds, which was, um, as we've done this before and it's gotten rave reviews, and it's about um, really how to, different techniques and ways to support the various ways that students' minds are wired. <laughs> um, so we're getting good feedback on that. Um, and then also we had the Massachusetts Safe Schools program. I think we had about 100 um, staff members from all different schools in the district attend their workshop in the Performing Arts Center on supporting trans and gender non-conforming students. Um, and that was a very powerful workshop. It also involved a few members from our own writing community and that was very well received and, and very powerful. Um, so there were a lot of things happening that day. And then the following Friday, we had our annual um, Blue Ribbon Institute. Um, I think we hit a high in our attendance. We had about 350 um, attendees from outside Reading. Wow. And so the, which means when we looked out, when I, we stood there and we looked at the Performing Arts Center, it was pretty full. Oh, full. We wow. were definitely over 800 people. I think the Performing Arts Center holds 900 or 903 mm -hmm. or something like that. So there were some seats available here and there, but it really was a full crowd. Um, and that's just a great opportunity um, to collaborate not only among each other in the district, but to include that many people from outside the district. Um, so we had over 80 sessions happening that day and three different concurrent sessions throughout the day. Dr. George Sagai, who I mentioned, was our keynote um, speaker. Who are, we've been getting very positive feedback. Uh, not only um, was he engaging and informative, but even entertaining. I mean, people really thought it was inspiring um, and really helped people, I think, understand the why we do this work and you know what is PBIS, what is MTSS, and why does it why is this good for for kids? You know, really remind us of that. Um, so I was going to say, I mean, it's also a great opportunity. We've been really working the last couple of years to make sure that we are able to offer the PDPs or the professional development points to teachers who need it um, for their relicensing. And we're also able to specify sometimes in particular content areas or the state now has new regulations, fairly new this year, um, in things about English language learners. Also, that's a certain number of PDPs are, are required each time um, any educator relicenses in supporting students with disabilities or with diverse learning styles. So we had a whole bunch of sessions that would have qualified for that. So we're able to generate PDPs for that. So, um, and I think that was two very 
successful days, but we're still getting a lot of the input and feedback. I know Linda was there as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's great about that time. Um, and then real quickly, quickly, I just wanted to mention too about science. I know last night at town meeting uh, that funding um, was approved. Um, so that we can move forward with the process that we've had going on, on now for the last, for certainly this year, but it really began last year. I also wanted to mention it because I know we kind of pushed back some agendas. We are planning a more comprehensive update at the upcoming May meeting for the school committee. Um, but I think everyone knows um, we've been piloting the No Adam program in our elementary school. So across all the fifth grade, um, it's there. Um, but in total, I think it's 15 teachers across the district have been using the program in their classroom. Um, so we have teachers at other grade levels as well. Killam Elementary, and teachers had the option to, to do this. Um, Killam Elementary staff realized they had several people that were very interested in doing that, so they actually decided to make sure they had a teacher at every grade level to be able to collaborate and kind of get that vertical perspective, which has been very helpful. So we've been getting informal feedback throughout, not only from staff, but also um, parents and administrators. Um, the middle level staff has been using all year long through their content-based professional learning community, their PLC, the meetings they have throughout the year, to not only be um, discussing and exploring options, but really unpacking the, the standards, talking about the instructional shifts that will probably um, need to happen, and they've been doing great work on that. Um, I have to spell, I mean, listening to the, the science team kids, I mean, you couldn't get a better example of those practices. Certainly one of the goals that we've had and, and is to make sure that the resources and materials, because it's been so long since we've been able to update those materials, that we're able to provide the teachers the support and materials, resources they need so that in turn they're able to provide kids the opportunity to have real inquiry-based, hands-on experiences um, in science. You know, and it's everything. I mean, when you hear, what I love is not just the, the actual things that they built and talked about, that's wonderful enough, but when you see them be able to use vocabulary and express their thinking, you know, and that's everything we talk about in STEM about, you know, the critical thinking and the real scientific inquiry process. Mm -hmm. And even things we've talked about, like at the high school and the gender um, imbalance and things, we, we address that by addressing it in elementary school. I believe and so this is an opportunity for us so we want to make sure that as, as we go through this process we're having <coughs> discussions as well that is an absolute priority that kids at a very early age are having those types of experiences um, so I mean I've been having meetings um, more formally now um, at the different levels um, I have some more coming up this week and next week as we're trying to um, get more information and consensus. I've also been getting a lot of information from other districts that are a little farther up ahead of us in terms of some of the results that they're also seeing from their own staff and from their from their students. We knew going into um, that, you know, it, each level may or may not be the same. Um, you know, I knew that not just elementary, meaning K-5, but K-2 might look a little different than 3-5. And six eight might look a little bit different, and so but we're it's taking a lot of time to kind of go through that. But our goal is by June we're going to have some decisions to to move forward. So um, we'll have more of an update in the next it's two weeks. I think it is the next couple weeks. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Have there been other curriculums also being piloted, or basically the No Adam has been the focus? so right now in the elementary school it's just been the No Adam program. And partly that came about from um, last spring, the elementary s teachers themselves, a, a group in that PLC, had a great interest in looking at that particular program. Um, it was demonstrated for them, and they were hearing from other districts as well, some staff members. Um, I had shared with them when they approached me with it that what they didn't realize at the time was I was also hearing information from other districts, even from other science educators at the high school level that were attending science-related conferences and events, that this was a program that was really getting some results. Um, and so that's that's been great. And we'll share more about some of the information we're getting from other districts as well that are now in their third year of um, implementation and the results that they're seeing. Yeah. <coughs> yes. I, I 
just wanted to say that um, I, I don't know how many years we've been doing the blue ribbon, but I think that it's been that it's outstanding that we've gotten so many more um, teachers and people from other districts. And the great thing about that is, like, our teachers and our staff don't have to travel to get that different perspective. So what's really nice about that is our teachers are, you know, right here immersed in this program, but they're getting to interact with people from other districts and, and get, you know, those other perspectives and other ideas. And so the, what's awesome about that is all of our teachers get to experience that um, versus, you know, when look, uh, obviously it's far fewer of our teachers end up with the opportunities to go do benchmarking or as part of awards and different things, um, you know, experience that. So I think that that's amazing to have that number of people and think about where we started. I don't know, there was a very, very small number of outside people even yeah. the first year, because it was, but it was right. very small. it was very small. <laughs> so that's, that's outstanding. Right. Dr. Dari. I just have two quick items. Um, there was another group that was supposed to be here tonight uh, along with the Coolidge Science team when we originally were meeting on April 4th and that's the Reading Robotics team mm -hmm. but they are leaving tomorrow for St. Louis uh, for the Worlds um, because uh, recently just prior to vacation they competed in the uh, New England first regionals and they won the same award that they had won here at the um, regional tournament, um, which was the Commissioner's Award, uh, which is the, the overall award, the, the best overall award. So um, with that recognition there, I believe 22 of the team members are going tomorrow to St. Louis to the Worlds. Um, their robot is packed and has already been shipped, um, and they will be competing against um, schools from all over the country, all over the world. Um, in a very similar competition than they than they have that they have this year, so um, again, hats off to them. I just think it shows the the types of programs that you know we have available for our students here in this district, and connecting to the theme of the type of science instruction and curriculum that we want for our for all of our students. That hands-on inquiry-based program. Um, I only see these programs getting stronger um, because of what we're going to be offering all students um, in, our, in our classrooms in the next few years. So it's very exciting. Um, I also want to give a plug to ArtsFest. Uh, we, we have a very busy week that week leading up to vacation, and it kicks off with ArtsFest, which is um, a whole celebration of the arts. Uh, Main Street in the high school has just got all kinds of artwork displayed from grades 1 through 12. Um, which is always great to see. And then the performances are going on inside the, the Enslow Performing Arts Center, um, ranging from the elementary chorus, the grade three, and then the grade four or five chorus to the, um, the combined middle school groups, jazz band and chorus, uh, which they don't get to practice that much ahead of time. Uh, so for them to come um, that afternoon and practice together for the first time is in to hear the amazing um, pieces that they sing and they play is, is great. And then our high school groups, our jazz ensemble, which is going to be, which won the gold and actually played at Blue Ribbon on Friday morning. And they're going to be um, performing at the Hatch Shell on the 15th of May um, because they are one of the best jazz bands in the state. Um, and then we had the concert band and, and other bands perform as well. So it was just a great two days celebration of the arts. Uh, RCTV came and did a whole um, filming of it. And there's a YouTube clip. Actually, it was in the newsletter this week um, that, that we sent out the YouTube clip on Arts Fest. So um, it really was a great week. And I just, I just want to piggyback to Blue Ribbon on what Mrs. Webb said. And, you know, I think we're in our eighth year. I think it's eight, eighth year for, for Blue Ribbon. Um, but it, it's a very unique experience that our staff has. Um, I, and the fact that we had 350 people from the outside this year, I think just enhanced it more. But I, I received a lot of positive comments from area superintendents that sent staff to this this year about the quality of the, the workshops, the, the speakers, the, all of the different things that, that they saw. And um, we're very excited to go back 
steal things from this conference and go back to the districts and use that. And that's what it's all about, is taking the best practices and, and doing what's best for kids in their own district. So I just want to give, again, a special kudos to Craig. Craig was the architect of, of, the, of the conference. And he had, he had help also from Laurie Miller, his administrative assistant. Uh, and the two of them put together a fantastic conference. So that's my report. Lori, if you're out there watching on TV, <laughs> thank you, because she does so much of the work on this. And I, I would always kid her that I can tell how well we're doing that week by what sort of stress looks level. on her face, stress <laughs> level. And I could tell we were things were really working <coughs> well, because each night we seem pretty in good shape. Um, but she does amazing work. I just need to quickly say about Arts Fest. Um, I mean, it is amazing. I was joking with some of the music teachers, the sixth grade band, I thought, because it made me think of it because I talked about student growth and assessment. And I joked with them that it would be great to start one of those concerts with a film or a video clip of the beginning sixth grade band. It's so being a former middle school principal at the beginning of the year when you can't really tell the difference between warming up and performing. You know? <laughs> and then to hear the sixth grade band perform, you know what, yeah. nine months amazing. later, and then forget about when they're seventh and eighth grade. It's just amazing. That is teacher impact and student growth. I mean, that's amazing. So what kind of tuition do we get for the 350 that come up from out of town? Do we charge them? The conference fee. We do, but it's a, it's it, it basically covers so the pretty expenses. Pretty much makes it the yeah. whole cost neutral thing. Some of the people that were able to bring in the Thursday beforehand is covered with that, um, with that as well. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've just. Uh, Sort of a question and a comment. I was looking at the um, chaperones for the robotics trip to St. Louis, and I know that it, I think at least one or two of those chaperones are parents who don't have kids on the team, and it just highlights again the really strong um, volunteer and how important it is. And you know, there's there's coaches and parents involved in the or coaches involved in the science team, adults ad involved in. So many of our things, um, the Cooler Science team I know about this, I, I know some of the parents who are just passionate about their own field and then really give the time. Um, sometimes I think parents start doing this stuff hoping like their kid will participate in it, but you can't control like right. that, especially at the high school level or even at the middle school level. Um, and yet, you know, parents stick with it um, either regardless of their own students' participation or after. And I really appreciate that because people are taking days off from work to go do that, and that's their vacation time. And so. Yes. Um, just I wanted to add with a plug for the Coolidge Yard Sale, but I neglected to bring the date of what that's going to be. But um, it's coming up soon. It's not this Saturday, but it's the following Saturday. Okay, and it is a great, it's great for many reasons. One, because it supports the Coolidge trip. That's how they pay for it. Two, it recycles all those things. Someone else's trash is someone else's treasure. And three, there are awesome things to get. We got my son's bedroom set there. We've got a bench that we got there for $10 that is still sitting and hosting bottoms in our backyard. Um, so it's really a good take in and you can both bring things to them and donate and get a receipt um, and you can then go shop and it's um, it's great to see and great to be a part of also the other thing I wanted to say sorry was just a kudos because I I can't sit here and not say this um, I'm continually impressed by the, the efforts not only to listen to what people are saying to our administration, but also to try to act on it. I know that Ms. Wilson has heard things about the reading specialists, and she's been working really hard to address that issue. And this letter is an example of acknowledging the questions and putting the effort in to reach out so that everyone will have the same story, the same explanation, and to have the peace of mind that things are happening. Mm -hmm. They might not be visible, but they're happening. And I couldn't help but notice the extra clause on the bottom of this, which takes us into the 21st century, which if you can't see, it has um, a translation um, saying where you can get this information in different languages. And I think that Reading needs, we're realizing that a good percentage of our students now um, our <coughs> English is a second language, and our special ed department is dealing with that and bringing it 
now onto everyday stuff, which is really important and deserves kudos. And the other thing I wanted to mention was we just had the communications audit. There was a very loud feedback about the, um, the ed line that we were using and the administration has, and teachers have done, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it was a team that did the research on Redekin. And we Redeker. are, Redeker. Redeker. Redeker, sorry. And we are transitioning to that. And that too, to me, says we're not just listening, we're also trying to incorporate change and, and improve. And even though people are stretched very thin, those things are happening, which I just wanted to mention. And then on top of that, I just wanted to ask a technical question. In the journey, which thank you very much, the pathways in the journey, in the journey there was mentioned that teachers need to save their, um, because of the transition, should school committee be saving our past emails so they don't disappear when the transition happens? No, that, that no. That won't happen. That's not deadline. Okay, thank email, you. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now we'll, uh, Martha, did we want to, we'll do the, we'll do that, the goal update last. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in your packet was a recommendation and the results of the school transportation bid that, mm -hmm. uh, um, the bid was available, I believe went out early March, um, and the opening, the results were open publicly on March 31st. Um, we did have um, six people pull the bid document. We only had two respondents that, that did come in and actually submit a bid for it. <coughs> um, it was done in con you know, it was done under the provisions of Chapter 30B, Mass General Law. Um, we worked with town council because a bid for transportation is pretty in depth, and, and um, you want to make sure that you are very specific about what you want. Um, and, and we were. Um, the basis for the award of the contract was the lowest price for all services for the first year. And by all services, um, this bid encompassed um, our regular day in district, uh, the kindergarten dismissal for midday, um, athletics, field trips, and our METCO transportation for um, the student population that comes uh, from Boston to Reading each day. Um, the METCO is paid for from the METCO grant, so that's, uh, that's um, but the total is included in this number. Just to give you perspective, if you're looking at the 430000 and thinking, oh dear, the budget in FY17 was 66000 because the budget is for only our in-district mandated transportation. Um, North Suburban Transportation was the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Um, they actually hold the current contract as well, and they provide reliable and professional service for the district for the past 20 years. Um, the last few times that we've bid the, the transportation, they've been the only respondent, so it was nice to have another respondent, and it was also nice to confirm that North Suburban is a good partner to us and, um, you know, had the, the lowest bid. Um, I'm trying to think what else I should do. What, else, what is there that any? relative to... Uh, what, 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 what type of increase or decrease hopefully so is that? So our mandated transportation is going up on a per day basis cost from $340 to $375. So it's about a 10% increase, which equates to $6,300 for the year. And that, that's the, man, like the mandated the regular mandated. day in district? Mm-hmm. That leads into a question I had. How does this work with our budget assumptions? So it's it's a little bit over what the budget was, but it's it's also very difficult to quantify at this point because a big part of our um, assumptions in the budget were that we're going to continue to have two buses, and that so a portion of that bus is going to help offset the second bus, and so. Um, without really knowing what the paid ridership is going to be for next year and what the mandated ridership is going to be for next year, um, there is going to be a negative impact to the budget, to the, at least $6,300, but I don't think it's going to be more than that, and it could be a little less than that if the paid ridership is, is more next year. So. Um, Martha, so this is the total year one cost. How many years is the contract? Um, it's it's re it's a one year contract, but it's renewable for a year two and year three. And the 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 
fees would be renegotiated for year two and three? No, no, no. They, they provided a schedule for, uh, for the years going out. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I know we have 30B. I, I'm such not a fan of 30B um, I, because, I, you know, there are cases where you get what you pay for. I just want to make sure, and I know that they've been a great partner and they've done a terrific job at it, but I do think it's important when you're talking about the transportation of our children to make sure that once again, as we start with them and again next year, that all of the protocols are in place, mm -hmm. that they fully understand our expectations for their level of services, and that you know we just don't have any unfortunate situations where things fall through the cracks. I mean, it just happens everywhere. It's human error. Let's do our best to get out in front of it and make sure that that doesn't happen here in Reading. No, and I completely agree, and I appreciate that. And that's one of the things that um, we thoughtfully went through the bid document to say that we want the buses to have cameras, and that the footage needs to be available immediate, and immediate means within a certain time frame if we ask for it and and the buses have to be a certain uh, newness you know they can't be more than so many years old or have so many thousands of miles on them so we did put a lot of um, things like that into the bid document to make sure to ensure the safety of the students because that is first and foremost great great that's good to hear go ahead oh, no. I guess what what always drives me crazy and I know I always say this is is it we always end up doing we telegraph what 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 we're going to spend i mean so i don't call that a negotiation i mean we, how, how come we can't do this before the budget gets done so that we're you know we're they, they know what we're they know what we've allocated to spend because we've already approved our budget and i guess is there any way well they, they actually don't because they don't know the met go amount and that's well, part of the i mean stuff. how i mean that that needle moves about uh, very little every year the metco amount i mean the um no it, it does change yeah. i mean that the the regular ed transportation piece is a very small part of this number yeah. 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 yeah um why do we only look at the lowest price for the first year not the whole schedule because we don't have to renew Okay. For years two and three, if we don't like what 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 year one is, it's yeah. a it's a one year one and done, and you can go out to bid again. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that precludes us from going out to bid again. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, move to authorize the superintendent to enter into contract with North Suburban Transportation to provide bus services to the Reading Public Schools. <coughs> Any more discussion? No. Five zero. Yes. Do you want to do the electrical? Sure. Do you want me to do this one? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, as as in prior years, we do um, go out to bid for contracted services, um, where we can enter into an agreement with a vendor, where they'll be virtually on call like a house doctor if you will so um, this bid was for our electrical repair contract and um, the bid was um, overseen by uh, Joe Huggins the director of facilities and as you can see from your packet there were four respondents um, two of the respondents were considered non-responsive and one of the criteria of the bid um, is that they're DCAM certified and as when they were, when Joe um, and I, I believe Jane Kinsella may have helped with yeah, this as she well. Did. She did. Um, when they were doing their due diligence based on the responses. So, so when you open the bids, really all you're recording is do they have the information that you requested and what was the dollar amount? And then you go back and you say, okay, well let me call their references. Let me let me do some more research. Mm -hmm. And so during their research um, of the bid results, um, they determined that two of the bids were considered non-responsive because they were not DCAMP certified. So that's why we couldn't go with Gone Green Electric, um, which on the surface of it is the lowest respondent. But you know, uh, 30B says you must be responsive and responsible, and they were considered non-responsive because of that DCAMP certification or the lack of it. Um, your Electrical Solutions was the next lowest bidder, and they were responsive and responsible. They have held the contract here in the district, I want to say it's at least the last three years yeah. they held it. And I, I think, I think so. it goes even further back than that, but my, my long-term memory is going. So, um, but uh, they, they have been uh, a good partner with us. And um, so uh, Joe um, happily <coughs> recommended that, um, that they, they be awarded the contract. So. 
Just as a point of clarification, um, because now this, this is under the core, um, but we feel it's important to continue to bring these to you, mm -hmm. um, even though technically you do not need to approve them anymore, we feel it's important that you, you know the types of services that are going to be going on in school buildings, as well as the town buildings. Mr. Chair, move to authorize the superintendent to enter into contract with your electrical solutions to provide electrical repair services. Second. Second. Any more discussion? Nope. Vote. Five zero. And Better continue with yeah, the, the budget. Yeah, <laughs> the budget. Sure. <laughs> All right. So included in your packet this evening um, was a budget update. Um, this update was done as of March 31st, um, leaving one quarter left in the fiscal year. And um, as you could see from the, the, um, the financial statement that was attached, we have an unencumbered balance of about $129,000, which is about 0.3 of our revised budget. Um, the adopted budget was, was updated to reflect the town core facilities change. Um, the forecast includes projected salaries and other expenses, um, all school-based end-of-year purchases, um, any planned expenditures like our technology replenishment, things like that, that's not encumbered yet, but it's planned. Um, and the recording of the revolving fund offsets. Um, so there are a number of cost <coughs> centers that as a result of the forecast assumptions are projected to be in a deficit. Um, at this time, we're not gonna come to the school committee to make any transfer requests. We'll do that close, we'll do that at one of the June meetings to, to true up the balances. Um, the, just starting at the top and working our way down, the administrative cost center has a positive um, balance. That's really the result of an open position that we're not gonna fill for the balance of this fiscal year. Um, the district-wide program cost center, which includes your health services, your extracurricular, your athletics and technology, is forecasted to finish with a deficit balance of about $41,000. That's a big, a function of that is um, Dr. Doherty and I talked at great length about the revolving fund offset that's budgeted for athletics at $380,000 for this year and at $396,000 for next year. And as you know, the forecast at the end of next year is the ending balance and that is gonna be under $10,000. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, we have forecasted only taking a $280,000 offset instead of the $380,000. Um, that's something that we can discuss with the committee. When Sharon and I did our due diligence and when we met with the auditors, one of the things that they said is if you're not gonna take what the budgeted offset is, there would have to be a school committee vote to say this, we're not going to take that offset. So it'll be further discussion. Um, but for purposes of, of a review of the financials, we wanted to include what we thought we wanted to do for the, the rest of the year. Um, by taking a $280,000 offset instead of a $380,000 will we'll help protect some of the, the position of that, that revolving fund and make it more viable going forward. Um, the school maintenance um, building budget is in a deficit. That's really re the result of having some additional staff to support the transition of the new structure. Um, the deficits and surpluses that you see in the regular build, the regular education budgets are really due to turnover expense savings. Um, the district-wide cost center deficit is the result of that 1.0 ELL teacher that we added at the beginning of the year due to our increased numbers. Um, we had an increased number of teacher mentor stipends because of the, the turn, large volume of turnover last year impacting this year. Um, there was also, um, excuse me, an increase in the uh, expenditure for the McKinney-Vento transportation cost, which at the beginning of the year, we really didn't have any homeless trans, uh, McKinney-Vento is homeless transportation, and, and we're required by law to um, allow them to stay in their school and help support their continued education in their home district if, if a student become, or family becomes homeless. We didn't have any um, throughout most of the year. And then uh, I want to say in December, we had a couple, and then by the end of January, we had five. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that we've gone back down to just a few now, so, um, but th there was a, a, an expense, an increase in expense mm -hmm. 
for transportation as a result of this. Um, and it's one of those things, it's, a, it's mandated, you don't necessarily, it's not something you can really budget for, it, you don't plan not for it. So. What line item is that in? Um, that's in district-wide. Okay, district-wide. So that's one of the reasons why the district-wide is in so a negative. negative. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so when you look in the, um, in the budget amendment column, you can see where we've been moving some money around. And so we moved some money from the high school Initially, the high school funded the two, the, um, the transfers that the school committee approved back in January, but we also had to move some money from the, high, the savings in the high school to the district-wide to help cover some of the expenditures in that, those lines, the, the McKinney-Vento transportation, the additional stipends, things along that line. So, um, And then lastly, the Special Education Cost Center, um, right now, we, fo we have it forecasted with a deficit balance of about $121,000. Carolyn and I meet bi-weekly at this point of the year mm -hmm. to make sure that we both know what's going on with, with any settlements, any ongoing uh, conversations, any um, new placements or, or things along that matter. At this point, we have all, all known out-of-district tuitions and transportation costs accounted for. Um, we have some money encumbered for placements or unilateral placements that we may want to settle or, or may be inclined to. Um, we've also included in our forecast about $250,000 to prepay FY17 tuitions. As you may recall, the last couple of years, we've really benefited from one of the, uh, one of the few things that we can prepay, which is special education tuitions. Mm -hmm. And the first year that we did it uh, was FY14, I believe, and we prepaid, maybe it was FY15, we prepaid about 219000 This year, we used last year's funds to pay about 300000 of this year's. And so we, at this point, we feel we wanted to include about $250,000 to prepay for next year, which will help position next year, which is going to be a very tight budget year. Right, because didn't we not include one you know, we, we, we're, we we're lower, we've yes. lower yes. estimate. For we caught, we caught one, one tuition with tuition transportation. Yes. Right, mm -hmm. so I think this is a very good proactive measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, we do, we do continue to see a number of uh, our, our tutoring expense for home hospitalization and, and out of school is, is continuing to be a number that we're trying to manage. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think... I'm not sure if you have any questions, if this was helpful to run through, if uh, there are specific Jean questions has, that yep. I can ask. I, think answer. I actually think you answered it, but okay. I just want to clarify. When I was going back and forth between the memo and the spreadsheet, there was a $41,704 deficit balance in district program cost center, and that number doesn't exist here because it's the combination, it's the combination. of health yes, services, so extracurricular athletics, and technology. Exactly. Okay. So when you approve that budget, um, you're approving that that's the district-wide cost center, which includes those four categories, you if you just will. broke it out a little more here. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. Can I just uh, ask about these? Um, I, without, and I can't answer it, because yeah. I, I don't yeah. know about anything. <laughs> but is that, um, is, it, is it things that are sort of more temporary and transient with, with students, or, you know, like a, an injury, getting hit with a softball and having a concussion, and you know, needing services, or is it, mm, is it, um, I don't know, just something that's more long, like longer term? I'm going to defer yeah. to Carol So it this. is a combination. <laughs> so sometimes we have students who may have had a surgery, you know, spinal surgery, and they're going to be out of school for three months, and so we need to provide tutoring. We have other students who are actually hospitalized for mental health or medical um, mm -hmm. situations, and we have some students who have um, mental health needs and they're having trouble getting into school, so we provide tutoring. So we have lots of different scenarios, and again, these are hard to anticipate. Right, um, right. Because they just kind of pop up, um, and we don't always know. We have some scenarios that we are very familiar with mm -hmm. because we're familiar with the students and they have a long-standing medical condition that that we're familiar with, but there are other scenarios that we just kind of you can't find yes. out. I get a letter yep. from a doctor, and um, you know, so we and just it's the services are generally provided to the student at the student's location or in a public place. So, oh, so um, okay. or you know, some students they might come into 
you know, library, the library. Okay. I mean, it depends on their condition okay. and what their, you know, their doctor has cleared them for and how much they can tolerate. That's also a piece. Um, we've also been utilizing some online options for those students when it's appropriate. So um, it definitely has been a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. We're using SEAM Collaborative is offering um, some tutoring services this year oh, as a okay. new service. So we're utilizing that, but um, sometimes doesn't come together as quickly as possible. We also offer it to our own staff to do after school hours, but um, mm -hmm. but it's definitely something unpredictable and yeah. I feel like it's a growing cost for us. Yeah. Mm. Okay, Come thank on. you. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. um, two thoughts on that increased expenditure for home and hospitalization tutoring services, two questions. One is, based on the ARCASA data that we've seen in the Youth Risk Survey, it appears that that's something that isn't just a Reading phenomenon. That is something that we're seeing state and nationwide, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So I just wanted to clarify yeah. that, that this yes. isn't something that's no. only that's happening correct. in our yes. city. Yeah. This is something yeah. that, that sadly we're typical for. Um, and I also think it, it just does point to the importance of MTSS. It's mm -hmm. attempting to address some of the underlying issues. Um, this is a, a solid data point that it is a problem that we need mm -hmm. to address. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. Martha, can you just talk about it? I didn't catch all the, you mentioned the busing for the for the homeless. Uh, so McKinney Vento. I don't remember that in the past, or at least it hasn't. It, it's it's been becoming a, a growing issue. Yeah. Uh, it's actually in other districts, it's become more so of a what, problem. What's the why do they call it McKinney? What is that's the name, the name of the law. The name of the law. <laughs> so is what, and that's what not is part of our, our regular bus contract, or. Well, we would pay, so if a family became homeless, so if they were a Reading family, they became homeless and they were relocated to another city or town. So if they were relocated to Woburn Danvers. or Danvers or somewhere else, um, under McKinney-Vento, those families have a right to continue in our schools if they choose, or they can choose to enroll their child in the, the public school where they've been relocated due to their housing situation. Um, if they choose to remain in the Reading Public Schools, we're required to provide transportation. We do cost share. Mm -hmm. um, um, so most districts are pretty amenable Medical, and we yeah. share the cost. But it, it isn't covered under our regular busing because you have to set up a separate route for those students to be picked up wherever they're living at that time. And it could be students who are either placed in shelters, um, students who are living in hotels, or if they um, are homeless and living with a family or a friend um, because they've been evicted. So we have seen an increase in that um, population and um, we just wanna do our best to support the students so that they have as much continuity in their education, but it is a cost that, again, it's an unpredictable. Uh, now if they, if they decide to, uh, you know, say they're relocated to a hotel in Waltham or something, mm -hmm. and they decide to go to school in Waltham. Yes. Does that yes. become yep. an out of district? Type? No, no, no. no it does they not. can just choose to enroll there and yeah. be students in Waltham Public Schools. Um, but again, parents are given the option as to what they think, and and we need to continue. I, I would like to interject that that as part of our end of year report and our schedule seven for transportation, we do specifically call out what our homeless transportation expense has been, mm -hmm. and I, I don't. It's it's not dollar for dollar, but there has been reimbursement we from the state. For, we do get some. Yeah. When I say we, it goes back into the general fund. It doesn't, you know, like well, like all money that we get in in that regard. Um, it's, so it's not a fully fund Funded mandate. Uh, mandate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other than, no other way to I say it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Some reimbursement, um, but we don't. We don't get hundred yeah. percent. And and that's why we we do try to track. Mm -hmm. We not try to. We do track it separately so that we can identify it on Schedule Seven and um, and and hopefully get some money back. So when, when you say that we try to cost share, so I know that there are like. There's hotels in Danvers um, that mm -hmm. the state mm -hmm. um, helps families. So are you saying, so like a bus that might pick up students there might drop students off at No, co cost no, share is, is we split the cost of the bus the with the cost. district that they're living in. So if the bus cost $100 a day, we would pick up 50 and Danvers would pick up 50. So oh, that's yeah, cost, so the exact cost. cost. Oh, I see. So, so even there. though they're in Danvers, but they're not, they're they not could going go to school in Danvers. Exactly. And Danvers would have had to pick up the transportation probably. Or, yeah. 
uh, or the cost of the educating students. students. Yeah. <laughs> um, and since yeah. we are a, oh, so do most districts are will, I that? really, I haven't encountered one that hasn't. Right. Most so districts just just do. Because, yeah, we would do sort of a courtesy. Yeah. yeah. The other guidance we have from the Department of Education is that if the student is relocated an hour or more away, they really don't want them on the bus yeah. for that long period of time. And we really oh. encourage families to enroll in the district where they're living. So, because that's just a long, long day, long day to be on the bus for an hour. Yeah. 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 It is, yeah. It is yeah. unfortunately becoming a bigger pro uh, problem. Yes. When, when you say that the money is reimbursed, but not, it doesn't, it goes back to the town mm -hmm. as opposed to back to replenish our budget. Correct. And it's, it's much and after the fact. Other reimbursement yeah. Goes the reimbursement in. comes in well after the, the, the budget fiscal year, year is over. over. Yeah. Sorry, I oh. went back to you. Oh, fine. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you said that it's not fully funded. Has there been any trend? Is it always funded at the same level? Does it go up and down? Is it? It goes up and down. Yeah. It's one of the areas that do tend to get cut. Yeah. and added and cut when you have the Senate budget, the House budget. This is always a lot of, it's one of the areas. That and regional transportation Station. is another one. Okay, so uh, Thank you. we're, we're uh, up to it. Uh, you got one more thing you have to do tonight. Or there's going to be a lot of kids upset. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before Last we do that, my, my, my stay point was going to be we're going to uh, put the goal discussion off until the next meeting. Oh, okay. Uh, yep. And because uh, really there is a basketball game. <laughs> 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 but, but, I thought it was just because yeah. we spent so much time with the students. And, you know, we were so energized with the students and ref and I'm yeah. sorry, I this shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a funny one because last night at town meeting, our town manager made a joke about snow and ice. And yeah. You don't want to say it out loud, but I guess tonight we're saying it out <coughs> loud. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to accept the superintendent's recommendation to set June 21st, 2016, as the official last day of school. For second. everyone but the seniors. <laughs> is there a second? I second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. It doesn't apply to you, Carl. Carl, I do apologize. There was only two this year. Sorry. <laughs> two snow days. <laughs> Last three years it was five or six. So. <laughs> Carl would find some reason to be here studying. Anyway. <laughs> so. Should I do this one? Yes. All right. Um, move to enter into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to litigation and the approval of minutes, and we will not return to open session. Second. Second. A roll call. Oh, yes. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>